it's all about the loony, the government can and should uh, take measures to try and bring the loony back towards its fair value. Other countries all around the world do that. Japan does it, of course. Brazil, China very tightly controls their currency. Even America. America has been very effective at bringing down their currency. They've done this thing called quantitative easing. Has anyone heard of that in the paper? Quantitative easing, where the government central bank in America, in essence, has just printed a whole bunch of money, billions and billions of dollars, uh, as a way of helping to get the economy back on its feet, but also as a way of suppressing the U.S. dollar. Because if they suppress the U.S. dollar, they make U.S. products look more attractive uh, internationally. Uh, and we've been making the argument that Canada should do the same thing. The Bank of Canada could do that, just like the U.S. Federal Reserve has, as the Bank of Japan has, as the Central Bank of Brazil has. They could also, because the reason our dollar is so high is because it's been sort of locked in with the price of oil, you could break that link by slowing down the pace of oil development in the tar sands in northern Alberta and restricting foreign ownership of the tar sands in northern Alberta. That would be another way to bring the dollar down. Another way you could bring the dollar down, appoint me as the finance minister. Okay? <laughs> CW Economist is now the finance minister. And the dollar would probably fall, I'd say, 10 cents overnight. Uh, another uh, reflection of uh, what's happened because of the dollar, because of the way globalization and free trade are working, um, is what's happened to Canada's uh, trade position in autos. Back in the 80s and 90s, when the dollar was cheap and Canada looked very competitive, Canada had a huge trade surplus in autos. That means we exported much more in autos and parts than we imported. Um, then the government got rid of the auto pact, which was a former system where companies would invest in Canada to keep a proportionate share uh, of their uh, production here. They also stopped doing some of the things that they did when they brought Honda to Canada. Remember, Honda came because the government gave them some trade preferences in terms of importing parts to Canada, uh, which uh, made it very attractive for Honda to come here. They stopped doing things like that, and then our trade surplus sort of collapsed, and we've now got a trade deficit. The fact that, uh, as a whole, we aren't producing as much automotive products as we buy. That's what's converted in, into a trade deficit of about $15 billion last year, um, that trade deficit alone is worth about 25,000 lost jobs for the whole auto industry in Canada. If we were uh, producing as much as we bought, then our trade deficit would be zero. We'd have a balance in essence. Yes, we'd still export, right? Most of what you produce is exported, and most of the cars Canadians buy are imported. But we'd have a balance between the two, and we'd have 25,000 more jobs uh, in Canada uh, as a result. Um, I'm going to scoot through just a little bit more on this. NAFTA, in this case, an acronym that means not another effing trade agreement, um, because that's what the government uh, is doing now. The federal government is looking at new free trade agreements with several uh, countries which have strong auto industries. The European Union uh, is one. They're looking at a free trade agreement with Japan. Uh, they've been trying to negotiate one with Korea, and now they say they're going to try and negotiate one with Thailand. Interesting that uh, uh, Honda obviously has production facilities in Japan and in Thailand. Uh, Honda would support the idea of a free trade agreement uh, with Japan. They would support one with Thailand too, uh, which in a way uh, the company's shareholders would like because it would allow them to bring products into Canada where there's a lucrative market, as I said, um, and sell them more cheaply. Uh, however, uh, it's to our benefit in Canada to want Honda to invest and produce here, not to import here, right? I mean, that's why Alston exists, because Honda was both pressured and lured to set up production facilities in Canada instead of servicing the Canadian market solely through uh, imports. And uh, our argument is the free trade model has not worked. And in fact, the more free trade agreements that we sign, the more our auto trade deficit has grown, and the more auto jobs uh, that, that we've uh, lost. So uh, we've been working with others in the auto industry uh, to try and um, stop some of those free trade agreements, uh, and also to put forward an idea of an industrial strategy, a vision for how to build the auto industry that doesn't depend on this notion that all you can do is tighten your belts 
uh, and cut your wages. And this is where we have a lot to learn from other countries uh, in the world. Uh, other countries, including other high wage economies. Japan is not a low wage economy. Wages in Japan are at least as high as they are in Canada. Germany is not a low wage economy. Wages in Germany are higher than they are in Canada. The US is not a low wage economy, okay? Especially after you adjust for uh, purchasing power uh, and the level of prices, um, wages in the US are higher than they are in Canada. Yet, those governments have adopted policies that are aimed at pushing the country, companies to keep a strong footprint in those countries and uh, more new investment, new products, uh, and new jobs. None of them relied on just signing free trade agreements. Every one of them had all kinds of measures uh, on the part of government using every tool in the kit to support investment and production by the automakers in their respective countries. Subsidized uh, finance and investment subsidies for the companies to encourage them to set up plants. State ownership, in many cases, uh, of the companies, where, for example, in Germany, Volkswagen is 20% owned by the government. Now, you can say that's a good investment because Volkswagen's been very successful and profitable, but it's also a good investment for the country because it helps them make sure that Volkswagen maintains a strong footprint in Germany. It's not to say that Germany doesn't have investments around the world, but um, they've got their own base in Germany, and that's why um, in Germany, no auto plants have been closed since the Second World War, uh, partly because the government helps to own uh, the industry. Restrictions on trade, for example, Brazil, where the auto industry is booming, Brazil just implemented a new policy limiting their auto imports from Mexico. The Mexicans, because they've got these very low wages, much lower than in Brazil, the Mexicans were expanding their exports to Brazil dramatically, just like they have to Canada. Uh, and the Brazilians said, no, even though the Brazilians <laughs> had a free trade agreement with Mexico, they said, we're going to put some limits on how much Mexico can sell in our country because we're more concerned with producing vehicles uh, ourselves. All kinds of measures that uh, countries have used around the world to prove that even in a high wage setting, a country has the right to expect that it will have and maintain a fair share of this industry. The auto industry is unique because of the productivity, $162 an hour, the wages that are higher than average, and they should be higher than average, the spin-off jobs through the supply chain and the other relationships so that um, every auto plant supports thousands of jobs in total, not just the people who are working in the plant. Uh, even tax revenues that are paid directly and indirectly as a result of the industry being there. Those are the reasons why a country has to uh, have an industrial strategy around auto. Canada, by and large, has not had one, and that's uh, one of the reasons why um, uh, we're arguing. And uh, we'll be, you, you'll see next week, the CAW is going to release a big new paper, a uh, policy paper on an auto policy for Canada. Uh, and we'll be putting out uh, some materials, uh, having community meetings, uh, arguing for the sorts of measures that have been successful in other countries. Uh, that could be here. Because hoping to protect your industry just by in cutting your wages and cutting your wages and cutting your wages again won't do the trick. You have to have a policy in place to make sure that you preserve your share of the industry. So that was hard to listen to an economist after a full shift at work. Will the government listen to you? Though? Will the government listen to us? Stephen Harper is not likely to listen to all of this, yeah. but you never know. Right? You never know. If they, they know how important the auto industry is because of the taxes that are paid by it. That was why, even under Stephen Harper, the government jumped in and helped to bail out GM and Chrysler and ended up owning a big chunk of GM and Chrysler. So that isn't what you would expect from a Stephen Harper government. But if we can make the case that, A, the auto industry is vital to Canada, we can't put all our eggs in the basket of the tar sands, right? We've got to have manufacturing and value added. And if we can show B, other countries are doing all this stuff. No one else has got their Boy Scouts uniform on and is following all the fair play rules. Everyone else is in there by hook and by crook to try and promote their own interests, if you like. So Canada should do the same. Then I think we could uh, convince even Stephen Hart. I'll, I'll make that wild, wild <laughs> claim that we can convince him of some of our policies. So, I thank you for your yeah. attention and let's uh, take some Q&A. Thanks for uh, staying awake.